Coming up on today's episode of The Virtual Couch, how to empathy and how to empathy well. Whether you're talking with your spouse, your kids, somebody at the job, somebody you run into at the park, what really is empathy versus sympathy? That and a whole lot more on today's episode of The Virtual Couch. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to episode 139 of The Virtual Couch. I'm your host, Tony Overbay. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified mindful habit coach, writer, speaker, husband, father, four, ultra marathon runner, and creator of The Path Back, an online pornography addiction recovery program that is helping people like you reclaim their lives from the harmful effects of pornography. If you or anybody that you know is struggling to overcome pornography or any type of compulsive sexual behavior, please visit pathbackrecovery.com. There you can find a short ebook that describes five common mistakes when people make when trying to overcome pornography or any type of compulsive sexual behavior. Again, that is pathbackrecovery.com. And please take a second, go visit the virtual couch on Instagram. Somebody is helping me with that now. There's some really nice motivational, inspirational messages. Also some uh, some questions out there. What, uh, what are some of the, your favorite episodes? It's uh, I've gotten a lot of good feedback on that have helped other people who are new to the virtual couch know how to connect. There's some things that they can go to. And uh, I would also uh, just recommend visit, stop by very quickly, tonyoverbay.com and uh, sign up there to find out more about some upcoming things, projects, fun things that are coming up because there is a lot coming up and I'm uh, really excited to talk more about that. So again, that's tonyoverbay.com or visit me on uh, at Virtual Couch on Instagram or there's a Virtual Couch page on Facebook or a Tony Overbay Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist page there on Facebook as well. Like them both, why not? And if you just have a moment and you don't mind doing me a solid, as the kids say, and subscribe or rate or review uh, any, wherever you get your podcast, that would mean a whole lot. That is the, the sort of podcast currency these days is uh, those, those rates, reviews, um, likes, subscribes, all of those kind of wonderful things. All right. So let's get on to today's episode of The Virtual Couch. I have to start with a little bit of a joke. When I speak, I often start with a concept of empathy. And uh, I will talk about that. We're maybe going to talk about empathy, empathy versus sympathy tonight. And there's a the comment that we often hear is an unattributed quote that goes way back. And it's basically you can't understand somebody until you've walked in a mile in their shoes. So I'll start with that. And then I will kind of get very, uh, very um, kind of serious and just say, but, you know, what I really like is uh, is this concept where before you criticize someone, really, truly, you must walk a mile in their shoes and that way, you'll be a mile from them, and you'll have their shoes. And that one goes to Jack Handy, former Saturday Night Live writer. But uh, but before we jump into today a little bit deeper, I did, and I pulled this from episode 67 of the Virtual Couch podcast from long ago. That episode is on rules of constructive communication on one of those um, parts of being uh, better at communicating, especially when you've been in a, uh, you're kind of stuck in a unproductive communication pattern with your partner. I've got a section on there where I do talk a little bit about, about empathy. And my reason for bringing that up is I, that's one of those places where I talk about empathy versus sympathy. And I think before we go further today, empathy versus sympathy refresher. And uh, I've had a couple of different ways that I've described this one. The first one that I ever really, that really sunk in for me was uh, this concept of walking up to someone and they are in a giant pit. Now, I don't know why they're in a pit, but they're in a pit. And sympathy looks like looking down on this person in the pit and saying, I, I am so sorry that you're in that pit. Like, that looks really, really bad. I mean, you're expressing sympathy for them, and you really feel bad for them. And that's a good, I mean, it's, it's I was going to say, that's a good thing. I mean, I feel bad that they're in the pit. There's sympathy, and uh, it's nice to have emotions. It's nice to not just kind of feel like, whatever, they're in a pit. But that's sympathy. Empathy, I always say, is, okay, you jump down in that pit with them. And then you kind of say, all right, I'm right here with you. What do you see in here? You know, and they're talking about, man, I'm in this pit and it looks so high up and I'm afraid of dirt or, you know, these walls seem so just uh, straight up and down. And this is what that brings up to me. And so, again, you're kind of jumping in there with them and understanding what that that perspective is like from for them. And, uh, and empathy really goes into what those experiences are like for that person. And I, I've tried to move the pit example onto hanging from a limb. And uh, again, walk over, see somebody hanging from the side of a cliff and they're on some branch or limb and sympathy being this really stinks, empathy being right there beside them and you're hanging on the limb with them. And then it's like, man, OK, I feel a little bit more of this. Now, again, the, the key here is you may not feel exactly what they're feeling because 
you might not necessarily be as afraid of heights. You might have had a, you might have grown up, you know, hanging from a tree limb every day. So to you, this is more normal. But the concept is trying to understand empathetically means trying to get on their level, trying to understand what things are like for them. And uh, you know what? I was going to say, we'll get into this a little bit more, but but let's do it right now. This brings up one of those concepts where I, I you know, I've got a couple of people that uh, that I'll see that, man, and back in the day, they would have been wonderful philosophers. And I mean, I'm talking about, and I've even joked lately that if uh, if there was a kingdom, you know, and kingdom had court jesters that were paid just simply to crack wise or to make a fool. And if these uh, same kingdoms also had philosophers where the, the king would just call upon their philosopher and they would come and just say very deep things that would cause everyone to think. I have a couple of clients that would just have made wonderful philosophers. And unfortunately, that can that can be a difficult, uh, difficult thing to be very good at in this day and age. If uh, if, you know, it isn't something that goes along with a job, you're not teaching philosophy or or writing or those sort of things. But in this scenario, um, what I'm, what I'm kind of talking about is. Uh, one of my clients said, hey, so do you know you really can't have empathy? And so and I'm talking about empathy all the time. So I know with this person's M.O., I kind of step back and say, tell me more. You know, where are you coming from? What's uh, what's the, what, where what's your experience with empathy? And they had a really good point. And the point being that if we're talking about pure 100 percent empathy, then can we have it? I mean, I not not necessarily, not really, because empathy at its core is understanding what that is like for that person in that moment. And that person comes to the table, that even the person hanging on the limb or the person in the pit, they are bringing to that moment all of their nature, their nurture, how they were raised, what was in their DNA, their birth order, um, their, their acceptance, their rejection, their abandonment issues, their attachment issues, their particular friend groups and what their friends have been through. So it's like all of the, and what I mean by that is that they've, you know, when you've been around your friends and you've asked that, you know, maybe you've said it, you've told a joke and nobody laughs. You kind of feel a little bit different about it, right? You got somebody else who might have a, one of those friends who laughs at everything. So then this, you know, if you're putting out jokes in front of that person, you know, you're feeling like you're a regular comedian. You're uh, and you're, you know, your, uh, your endorphins are, are, you know, rising, your, uh, the pleasure centers of the brain are kind of activating, the synapses are opening up, because whenever you are around this other person, and you say things, they laugh, they make you feel good about yourself, or if you got somebody else who, that isn't the case, every time you're trying to crack a joke, and they're just like, kind of not paying attention or frowning, you're gonna, you're gonna feel a little bit worse. So, I mean, so much goes into empathy, so much goes into um, who we are as a person, again, not just, uh, it's everything. It's all of these concepts, all of your private experiences is what they call it, and acceptance and commitment therapy. So I only bring that up because, again, can you, this philosophical debate of can you truly have pure empathy for someone? I guess in theory, no, but uh, that doesn't mean you don't try. You know, you don't try to kind of try to understand what somebody else is going through. And let me, <clears throat> and then before we get to a little bit more of these empathetic phrases or sayings, in episodes 93 and I think 94, I did a, a two-part series on teaching kids empathy, and that was all on evidence-based models of teaching empathy. And I think it's not just for teaching kids empathy, but it's a nice refresher to go through of how to maybe develop or nurture empathy for yourself. And, and the reason I bring th these two episodes up are there was a I referenced um, Gwen DeWar. She's a PhD, and she talked about in teaching empathy, she said that might, <clears throat> excuse me, that might sound strange if you think of empathy as an eight, a fixed trait. Um, or a talent that some people are born with or others lack, because empathy isn't an all-or-nothing proposition. She said that uh, it isn't something that unfolds automatically in every situation. It isn't even a single ability or skill. A skill. And then Gwen DeWar uh, quoted um, uh, Jean Desity and Jason Cowell, who published a paper in 2014, where they argue that the word empathy has become a catch-all term for three distinct processes. And I've thought about this often since uh, recording these, that episode. She talks about the catch-all for empathy is really broken down into three different components, three distinct processes. One is called emotional sharing, which is also called emotional uh, contagion, which occurs when, experience, when we experience feelings of distress as a result of observing distress in another individual. So emotion sharing is a little bit of what I was talking about there with sympathy. So um, a lot of people feel, and this is why that can be confused with empathy, because uh, that is a distinct process that sometimes is roped into this catch-all phrase for empathy, but it's really emotional sharing. So it's just observing distress and feeling for that person. The second, the second of these th uh, three distinct processes in this catch-all term of empathy is empathetic concern, which is the motivation to care for individuals who are vulnerable and distressed. And again, if you haven't listened to these episodes, go back, 93, 94, 
Um, I believe it is because that empathetic concern is something that can be nurtured with your kids, for example. And I find that it's something that some people are, I, I feel, are more innate. It's more innate or more born, um, a, you know, born into someone is this trait of empathetic concern, which is kind of that rooting for the underdog or looking out for the little guy. So when that motivation to care for individuals who are vulnerable or distressed can uh, can kind of overwhelm or, or well, I was going to say overwhelm somebody, but it's also something that can be leaned into if that is a real trait or talent that somebody possesses. And then the last one, the last one of these distinct processes um, that uh, Desity and Cal will talk about in this 2014 uh, paper is perspective taking. So that is the ability to consciously put oneself in the mind of another individual and imagine what that person is thinking or feeling. So when we speak in everyday terms of someone being very empathetic or showing low empathy, they argue that we're probably guilty of mixing up several distinct concepts. So perspective taking is probably the thing that I often refer to when I'm talking about what's that like being in that pit. Although you can touch on all three of these um, distinct processes of the perspective taking of trying to understand what that person's going through, empathetic concern, which is this motivation to care for somebody who is down in that pit, and then emotional sharing where, you know, you're, you're experiencing these feelings of distress by observing the distress in another individual. So they, they go on in that uh, article at, at the Desity and Cowell to say certainly some individuals score high in all three areas and others may test poorly across the board. And they, may, then they make the good point that that's a small percentage of the population. But it's common for people to experience these phenomena in varying degrees and to change over time. And just one more little plug for those, uh, those two, that two-part episode. For instance, a lot of, of young children may show high levels of emotional sharing um, demonstrate strong but more limited evidence of empathetic concern and then absolutely struggle with certain types of perspective taking. And as they get older, their perspective taking skills improve, especially when we provide them opportunities to practice. And that's the key. So that perspective taking is really the ability to get into someone's shoes and try to really have their perspective and understand what's going on. So let's uh, getting on to the meat of today. Um, you know, it's funny, I, I've got uh, notes all over the place over the years of empathetic phrases. And a lot of times when I'm talking about the emotionally focused therapy, the EFT skills, when, when one person in a relationship puts out this emotional bid, when they say, you know, I, I feel like things aren't the way that they used to be in our marriage, instead of having their partner say, I, okay, I can't believe you just said that. Or if they, instead of them saying, you know, shutting down and frowning and, you know, just saying, oh, you're right. I'm a horrible partner. You know, or uh, or even them saying the, you know, again, people getting animated and I really can't believe you said that. Like, that makes me so mad. Do you know how hard I've been trying to make our marriage better? So all of those are the, are not empathetic uh, statements. So I, I kept a little running total. I've got a whole Google document on trying to just come up with these empathetic phrases. And uh, but then I thought, you know what, I, if you I, I've looked around a little bit and there's a woman named Laura Click. Um, she's again, writes on this medium dot com. And uh, she has an article that is talking about, I think, it, and I should have known this one better, but I think it's like 30 empathetic phrases or 31 empathetic phrases. And so I really thought that it's just she did a nice job of putting a lot of these together. So rather than recreate the wheel, I thought we'd kind of go through this and just talk a little bit more about what these exact phrases can be or are or what they look like. Because I get a lot of people who are trying to just have empathy in general or when they're doing the EFT process and they just run out of things to say. So they'll say, tell me more about that. So if their partner puts out this emotional bid, let's go back to that one of, I feel like the, things have changed in our marriage. I mean, I, I want you to know right away, from my perspective, you know, thank you, partner, for putting that out there. Because if they're hanging on to something that, that, that's that heavy, that's maybe bothering that much, and they don't feel like they can open up to their partner, you can understand that that's a, a thing that, they, that might continue to grow or fester or drive a wedge in the relationship. So we want somebody to share these emotional bids. We want our kids to come up to us and tell us that uh, they're really struggling right now with something. Maybe it's at school or friendships or that sort of thing. And I, boy, not to get too far off the mark, but whether we take that, that couple's relationship or we take that parenting example, if our kids come up to us and say, you know, I'm really struggling with my friendships right now or, or one friend in particular, you know, what are some of the, the, the unempathetic things, but maybe sympathetic things or unempathetic things that we often say? where we want to say, hey, you know what, champ, um, you're going to be fine. It's not really a big deal. You're young. These friendships aren't going to matter in the long run. And then, you know, then we want to tell them a few stories of I had friends when I was in high school who did the same thing. And so just understand that all of that was so well-meaning, 
but it wasn't this empathy. There wasn't empathy there. There wasn't a, hey, tell me what's going on. Tell me more about that. And, and I feel like this is the part where I was thinking about this episode so much of the last couple of days of where it just gets to be so difficult, even when you mean well of not wanting to just cut somebody off and start sharing experiences and stories with them because we feel like that that is going to benefit them. But in reality, and I get to hear this on my couch all the time, whether it's with couples or, or teenagers, whoever it is, that as soon as somebody starts going into the, no, 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 I, I know exactly what you're saying. You know, when I was young, I did this. Or, I mean, and that's just not, it, again, it can be, it's better than having somebody to shut the other person down, but it's just, there's not a lot of empathy there and it doesn't necessarily help, especially when somebody just wants to be heard. So, so these empathetic phrases, you know, I, I still love this concept of, um, Stephen R. Covey, seek first to understand before being understood. You know, tell me, teenager, tell me what's going on in your relationships. Let me listen to you first. And we can even go good old functional brain scan here and say, if, if we were looking at the brains of someone who is being heard, then the, the little synapses, neuropath, everything's opening up in the brain. So when we're telling them, no, 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 I know exactly what you're talking about. Let me, let me, let me tell you a story about what this was like for me when I was young and again, we're going to watch the brain kind of shut down. And and because here goes this uh, person who just put out this this emotional bid that they just said, I'm struggling. And only then to have a person tell them, hey, it, I, I don't want to hear any more of what you're going to say. Let me let me get into lecture mode or story time because I'm going to tell you the story and that's going to motivate you. It's it's not. I mean, in some situations, it it might temporarily motivate, but we but people want to be heard. So Laura Click says, um, when something happens uh, terrible to a friend or a loved one, it can be difficult to know what to say. And I love how she starts it off by saying we often reach for these kind of rephrases or these kind of phrases or responses. Everything happens for a reason. This too shall pass. Just look on the bright side. God has a plan. I know how you feel. If it's talking about death, you know, this person's in a better place now or even in situations that this could be a blessing in disguise or something better is around the corner. All of those statements are, are they sound wonderful in theory. And, uh, and boy, I hope that a lot of them are true, but they do little to help a person feel better. And uh, Laura goes on to say it, it often minimizes the other person's pain and it does little to connect with how he or she is feeling. And, and I like she points out that I, she says, I don't believe we do this intentionally. And I totally agree. Again, I love the concept that, that we are coming from this good place. We want to be there and we want to help somebody and we want them to think that we are right there beside them and that, that we understand what they're going through. But we use these statements because they've been said to us in similar situations as well. And uh, uh, Laura goes on to say that we've been conditioned to believe in these cliched responses or the best things to say when somebody's hurting, even if they weren't helpful to us when we were in that same situation. I love that concept. When you've gone to somebody with a lot of pain or sorrow and they immediately like to tell you stories about their aunt or uncle or something that they went through a decade ago. And I, this is the part where I honestly sound like I'm making jokes. But uh, just by nature of the work that I do, I hear these stories often, and some of them literally, literally are as much as that I had a client uh, one time who had a, uh, a parent pass away and having someone within the, the, the next week compare the loss of a pet with uh, this person's loss of, of, a, of, a, of a parent. And uh, man, you know, talk about uh, bless their heart for trying to connect. But uh, in that scenario, um, you know, that stuck with this person for a while rather than having somebody just say some of these empathetic phrases of just, what was that like? That, that really has to stink. You know, tell me more about that. So how to show empathy, um, you know, even if you haven't lost a spouse or you've or been diagnosed with cancer, um, as, uh, as Laura Click says, you, you can imagine what, that it might, what it might be like if those things happen to you. That's what empathy starts to look like, which is connecting with another person's pain or trying to understand how he or she might be feeling. But I do think that it goes a little bit deeper than that and trying to not, though, dismiss what the other person is going for, for or what, what experience they're having. And again, it goes into that. Ask questions. Seek first to understand. So how to show empathy. So trying to put yourself in another person's shoes. What do you say? And uh, Laura says, to be honest, showing empathy is a lot more about action than it is about words. And I really do love that. When a friend or loved one shares something difficult with you, they're typically looking for somebody to listen. So um, what does empathy look like? Uh, she goes into these examples of empathetic responses. Acknowledge their pain. Um, one of the best things you can do is acknowledge how somebody else feels. Acknowledge does not mean I know what you're going through. It just means that, you know, and she writes, here's some examples of what this sounds like. I am so sorry that you're going through this. Or, and I like how she just, the, the next one, the example, she says, 
wow, that really sucks. I mean, it really does. Cause I, and I have found that, uh, I don't know, for some reason I must've grown up with suck being a bad word, but, <laughs> but, uh, um, no shame there. But, uh, so if I, if I say to a client, okay, that just really stinks. I mean, why <laughs> go into the semantics of words, right? Let's go all deep, uh, nerd, um, therapy world here. It's called relational frame therapy, uh, theory, which means some words mean one thing to one person and not to another. I can say stink, but uh, for some reason suck. I don't know what, what it does to me. Um, but wow, that really stinks. And a lot of times people just want to be able to say, you're right. It does. It really does. Or somebody, if you are showing, um, empathy, you know, for somebody it's saying to them, I, I hate this happened to you, or that must really be hard, or that sounds really challenging or, you know, um, uh, even this one borders a little bit on sympathy, but the, I can see how that would be difficult. I, you know, I'd like to go to, into that more about, tell me the, what, like, what's the hardest thing about what you're going through right now? I mean, that's a good phrase. And I should have given you a little bit of heads up if you got a pen or paper or pencil or iPad and pen, Apple pencil or stylus or however you take notes that um, we're going to give some really examples. So let me go through those again. It's like, man, I am sorry you're going through this or that really must stink or this has got to be hard or this sounds really challenging. And uh, in, in all of those are going to be, you know, you can you can tweak those slightly of, you know, Hey, what's the worst thing that's, uh, that, man, you've been feeling? Tell me your whole range of emotions these last few days. What, what's that like? Or have you ever felt like even anything close to this before in the past? You know, just you want to get somebody talking. You want them to be heard. Again, the goal is not to say, because I know how that feels. You know, and I, and I, I was uh, thinking about this one this morning, actually, uh, <laughs> in the shower, where I had a client who I really love this person to death. And they were kind of questioning to me, their, their spouse had, had questioned this person's empathy. And this person said to me in the session, they, they said, you know, h- help me if I'm missing anything here. Cause, cause I, you know, I get it. So empathy is me, you know, saying, Hey, look, I, I know exactly what you're going through. And I know that's hard. And I, and I stopped them right there. Cause I just said, you know, man, I love that you trust me with that question, but right there is where the empathy part is not happening is when you tell somebody, I know exactly what you're going through because I have been there. Because the person is right there in their mind, they're like, you know, but you haven't. You've never been me going through a situation. You've never been me with all of my own private experiences and those sort of things that I bring to the table right now. Back to what I said earlier, that was nature, nurture, birth order. Nobody, nobody has has understood all of those things, you know, here on this earth in the moment to know that what, what that's like that we're going through. So sharing how you feel back to with that client, it was nice because that was a nice light bulb moment where they were like, oh, OK. And then I was able to say, you know, that's sympathy. Sympathy is, man, that has to stink like to, not, to see what you're going through. And then empathy is, you know, and, and I'll tell people even when they're trying to get good at empathy, be vulnerable. You even say, man, I want to tell you that I get where you're coming from. But OK, I get I get what we're talking about here. And of course, I don't understand exactly where you're coming from. So Help me try to understand it. I want to know. I want to hear what you're going through. So uh, in point two, Laura uh, Click says, share how you feel. She said, sometimes it's okay to simply admit you don't know what to say or that you're having a hard time imagining what it would be like to experience what the other person is going through. I like that concept right there. Um, she said, whatever you do, just make sure you don't diminish the other person's experience or make it all about you. Ooh, that, if I could bold that one. Um, When you are trying to express empathy or or have empathy for someone, that one, I want to just be in the forefront of your brain. Do all you can to not make it about you. I've done that as a parent many, many times where my kids are telling me stories and I honestly find myself wanting to do that whole, wow, I really am about to tell them a story about my high school experience when uh, I had records and CDs, Um, a telephone had a cord to it. Um, you know, I I had to go, I I didn't have instant access to anything. I didn't know exactly what my friends were doing because I couldn't see them on Instagram. Uh, You know, I I don't know what it's like to have people, uh, direct messaging me that, I mean, so, and I was about to say, no, man, I know exactly what you were going through. Uh, one time my friend did this and, you know, and then for the next two days when I didn't have any interaction with them and I was going to the gym on my own and I, you know, that this is what it was like for me. So see champ, I totally get where you're coming from. It's like, no, you don't dad. Uh, you know, so, um, which is a whole other, I guess I'm kind of getting a little tangent driven now, but, uh, man, I've had, I had a couple of in, uh, instances, one where I had a speaking opportunity, one where I was in a meeting and uh, having someone who was similar to me, my age. And we were talking about the quote kids these days. And they mentioned the fact that they didn't have an Instagram account or a Facebook account. And this person was just so like, you know, I felt like the room quieted and they wanted everybody to stand up and applaud. You know, you, sir, you get the, the award for holding off on social media through the year 2019. 
And instead, there happened to be a younger person in the room. And then I jokingly just said, uh, let's just fictitiously say this person's name is David, even though they were actually a girl and not named David. And uh, if I looked over that person and said, you know, uh, David, uh, how are you, how you feeling about that? Are you super impressed? Because yeah, it was a really fun kind of uh, environment. And I said, uh, are you super impressed that this person has no Facebook account or Instagram? And uh, the person uh, played by the role, David, said, man, uh, no, <laughs> you know, um, I don't want to sit around and, you know, Indian style around them and just say, you know, tell me more about how you uh, interact with people nowadays and, and, and tell me that it would be better if I did it that way, because I honestly have zero idea what that even looks like or means. So um, so here going back into this uh, sharing how you feel. Um, and again, I went off on that tangent about don't make it all about you. Here are some examples of what this could sound like. And I love uh, uh, Laura says, wow, I don't even know what to say. Or here's a good one. I can't imagine what you have to be going through. Um, it's it's fair to say, I, I mean, I wish I could make it better or my heart hurts for you or it, it makes me really sad to hear that this happened to you. So, I mean, those are those are feelings. I mean, it is. You can be sad. I and that's the one I run into a lot. It's like, man, this breaks my heart. And I say that too, breaks my heart. I'll say this, this breaks my heart that you're going through this because I have no idea what that must be like. I really don't. Or I might have an, I, you know, I try to imagine what that would be like, but it really breaks my heart. Um, I love this next one that uh, she talks about in this article. She says, show gratitude that the person opened up. A lot of people struggle with vulnerability, struggle with vulnerability because they've been burned before. They don't want to share their struggles because they may not receive an empathetic response. And uh, she says in this article, she says, I definitely felt that way for a long time. So when somebody chooses to open up to you, it shows that they trust you and it's your job. I love the way she says it's your job to honor that, honor that and respond with care. Let the person know that you appreciate them sharing and acknowledge that uh, you know that it might have been difficult to do so. And when you do this, it signals that you are a safe harbor for vulnerability. So here's what some of these responses might look like. Hey, thank you so much for sharing that with me. I mean, that goes so far. That's, you know, that's, that's a big piece of therapy is like, I really appreciate you trusting me with this. Um, she, here's some other phrases. I'm glad you told me. I really am. I'm really glad that you have a place that you can come and, and dump and share. And I'm really glad that, that you chose me and that you told me. Uh, another example, thank you for trusting me with this, with this. This really means a lot. Another example might be this. This has got to be hard to talk about. So really, I appreciate you opening up to me. Number four, um, she talks about is showing interest. Going through difficulties can be terribly isolating and lonely. And that's why people share their struggles. They're longing for connection. That is so true. We go back to the basics of attachment and people putting out these are you there for me signals. When people are hurting, they, they want to find that secure attachment. They're desperately trying to attach and find a safe harbor um, somewhere that they can they can share and feel heard and not feel shut down and judged. And and even when people have this pattern or history of not feeling heard, uh, you'll watch that they they desperately are trying to find somewhere or somebody that will hear them or will listen to them. So the best way to connect to somebody is is again not by talking but by listening. So show you care by asking questions and show a genuine interest in what they have to say. And here's what that could look like. Um, how are you feeling about everything? Or here's a big one that I love. What is, what's this been like for you? So I, I want to know everything. Take in this is where I'm adding to these. Take me on your train of thought. I want to hear like how quickly do you go from one emotion to the next? Like what's an example of that? Or you know, a, here's a good one too. It's like man, I want to make sure that I really understand. So so kind of tell me what that's like again. It, you know, just really air this out. Let this go. Feel like you can just free associate. Or um, this is where, and Laura gets into the, the, where she starts saying, okay, what I'm hearing is that you're feeling blank. And, and is that right? So if it's like, man, what I'm hearing is you, you are angry right now. I mean, am I reading that right? And cause that any of these things will get somebody to talk now I don't say what, what I hear is you're feeling angry right now. Am I right? And they say, yes. And I say, cause I know exactly what that's like. You know, one time you know, this person cut me off in traffic and I got so mad because at that point you'll just watch the person who came to you to open up just start to shut down and glaze over and that sort of thing. Um, and I like this too. Uh, she says she, she has the phrase in here. Is there anything else that you want to share? Cause a lot of times I feel like people are honest to goodness, just trying to test the waters and test for safety. And I'll see this in sessions a lot. I've got a little clock that I think is sometimes annoying for people. Um, I think I posted something about it on my Instagram account at one point, it's called a time timer and it shows this red representation of the, like the 50 minute hour in my case. And people will watch that, that timer tick down, down, down. And a lot of times I feel like, okay, we've had this amazing session and I'll say, is there, is there anything else that you were kind of hoping to share? And then usually the person will look over the clock, they'll see a few minutes and they're like, yeah, you know, I, I really was kind of, I just want to make sure that we talked about this or, and usually that thing at the end is something that they were still the whole process of the hour 
was just gauging for safety before they open up about something that may be really difficult to talk about. So I just like this concept, this phrase of, is there anything else that you want to share? So is it like, man, do you feel like we covered everything or are there other things that you're thinking or, you know, and a lot of times that's where it's okay to have some silence. It's okay to pause. Uh, and that can be really hard for people too, is to just let, let it sit there for a minute because sometimes the person is gauging how the conversation just went for the last hour, half an hour, 15 minutes, whatever it was, so that they can then now feel like they can really open up about something they, they're really hanging on to. Uh, number five, she talks about be encouraging. She says, I believe most people really want to be encouraging when a friend or a loved one is going through a tough time. The problem is we often show this by trying to, and she nails this one, fix the problem or force the person to look on the bright side. And while our intentions, again, are good, the approach is rarely helpful to the, per rarely helpful to the person in pain. And that doesn't mean you can't be encouraging, but you have to be mindful of how you approach it. Instead of saying, it'll get better, or <laughs> here's a good one too, or, okay, here's what I would do. You know, people say that one too. Just remind the person that, you, that you're grateful that they open up to you. Um, she says that, that you love them. Share what you admire about them. Uh, help them see what y you do or what that person does that makes you think that they're an amazing person who is worthy of love. And she just says, here's some examples. You, you are so brave, you know, or it sounds like you are so strong or you are so talent, talented or you matter or you are a warrior or I'm in your corner or I love you or I'm proud of you. And I got to tell you, there's a couple in here that I just I really love. I'm in your corner and I'm proud of you. I find myself really feeling just this I'm so proud of you moments. And I often have to show this caveat when it's somebody that is my age or maybe even a little bit uh, older. And I know that's just probably some sort of uh, social stigma from growing up where it's hard for me to say I'm proud of someone that is my age or a little bit older. But the I, my job is to be vulnerable. And so I will often and, it's, and I'm only saying this because trying to maybe model this type of thing. But it's OK to even say that, uh, hey, what I'm about to say, I don't know, it makes me feel a little bit goofy or saying it, but I really mean it and that I'm proud of you. I really am. And I only say that, you know, I, and maybe there's people here saying this, Tony, own your emotions. You shouldn't feel goofy about it. But the reality is, if I do, I am owning my emotions. And so I would rather say this might sound a little bit weird coming from me, and I don't know why it does, but I'm super proud of you, person who is my age or higher. And uh, it's so funny. For some reason, if they're a year or two or younger or whatever that is, it, to me personally, my own private experience, that one feels fine. No problem. Super proud of you, person who turns uh, 50 uh, November 23rd, instead of me, who will turn 50 November 24th, I can be proud of you. But if you, uh, you know, oh, just give up my age, huh? There we go. Um, and then the other one is that, uh, so that's the, I'm proud of you. The other one is I'm in your corner. I, I mean, I really, and I mean every bit of this. And some of my clients will know that if they hear this, they're like, wait a minute, did he say, does he say that to everybody? And not necessarily, but it's this concept of I'm in your corner or I'm on team. Let's just say the guy's name is Ted. It's like, I'm on team Ted, you know, and and Team Ted doesn't mean that I'm going to say, you know, when they tell me that. And then I ran a stop sign and then I, you know, and then I went and I, I don't know, I was going to say something probably not appropriate or whatever. But whatever they did that wasn't positive, I, you know, it's not like, all right, Team Ted, that sounds awesome. It's like, oh, man, oh, tell me more about that one. Like, why did you run the stop sign? Uh, I got to be honest, that one's hard for me. But uh, Team Ted is still, though, it's like I'm in your corner. People want somebody in your, in your corner. They want somebody on your team. Be supportive. Uh, number six, she said, when it comes to empathy, actions often speak louder than words. You can show you care by giving a hug, sending flowers, writing a handwritten note, offering to mow the lawn, do the laundry. When you do these things, it helps the other person feel loved and supported. There's an old concept that goes around here where it's like, people love to say, hey, let me know if there's anything I can do for you. I'm guilty of that. I probably said it this weekend a, a handful of times. But uh, a lot of times people don't feel like they can ask for anything. Um, I had a religious leader and a friend of mine who used to just say, um, and that's why I love that they talked about mowing the lawn. He would just go mow their lawn. You know, it wasn't even a tell me what I can do for you. Um, he said, I just go mow their lawn because everybody needs their lawn mowed. And it was funny because in my mind, I'm like, what if they had a lawn service? Yeah, but, but that's beside the point. Go mow their lawn if that's the thing that you do. Um, and if you look, you're looking for something to say, then she says, here are a few ways to articulate that you care. I'm here for you. How can I help you? What do you need right now? I'm happy to listen at any time. Um, hey, I would like to do blank for you. So you know, I'd really like to mow your lawn if that's okay. Cause that, you know, or, or I'd really like to bring you dinner. Like, like that's a big one too. But, uh, but I really like that. What do you need right now? A lot of times a person is going to say nothing. And then instead of saying, well, you know, let me know if you need anything. A lot of times I think, you know, take a second right now and think, what do you like? What, what is good for you? I, I will tell you homemade chicken pot pie. I never knew this existed, which just sounds so funny until, uh, we had our first child. And I still remember, um, the first person who brought over homemade chicken pot pie, and so my wife now makes a mean chicken pot pie. So if somebody is really struggling and we don't know what else to do, man, we'll make that chicken pot pie. And uh, so far, 
I feel like there's a perfect track record of that uh, going over well. Um, so, or, or how can I help? Okay, I'm here for you is a good one. But she ends up by saying there's no script for empathy. Uh, bless your heart, Laura Click, you are correct. The reality is that there's no script for empathy. It's, it's less about what you say and more about showing up and listening well. Showing up, listening well. And she says, I hope that these examples will help you avoid the well-worn cliches and find a better way to express empathy to those around you. <clears throat> and, I, and I love that concept, too. I often will issue cliche warnings in, in therapy even of like, all right, here comes a cliche. My, you know, here it comes. I, want, I need to have like a little bell or something. And a lot of times I have people say, well, they're cliches for a reason. And sometimes that's true. They're, 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 well, it's probably always true. But uh, some cliches are better than others. But so, I, you know, I appreciate you taking the time today. Um, it really says a lot to me. <laughs> I was going to try to have empathy there. Um, it says a lot to me that if you've stuck it out this long, that you really, that empathy is something that is important to you, that you want to learn more about. But I, but I hope that some of these phrases will ring true. You can jot some of them down. If, you, uh, if there's somebody in your life that you feel like is struggling a little bit with expressing empathy, bless their hearts. And that's the part where I'm saying they really mean well when they immediately go into fix-it mode or when they start to tell you what it's like to, you know, what it was like for them growing up. Um, again, bless their heart. They mean well. Sometimes we just need the tools to really understand what empathy is like. Sometimes um, sympathy is a good thing. Sometimes people do just want to hear that stinks. I mean, we, we talked about that a little bit in here, too. But that stinks, comma, tell me more. What's this like for you is, is a good thing as well. Yeah, it's kind of, I've, ta- I've used this one on a, a several uh, podcast episodes, I think, in the past. And I was using it at a training a week or so ago. And I really like it. And it's one that uh, my sensei, Darlene Davis, who I had on an episode long, long ago, said where, you know, talking about therapists. And when, you, uh, when I was early in grad school, she talked about that a lot. Sometimes people get into therapy because they're like, I'm really good at giving advice. You know, it's like, well... That's kind of not quite what a therapist is doing. Um, a therapist is trying to learn a ton of skills and understanding like how, uh, how, how people work and how to guide them based on the client's self-determination, what they bring to the table and what their goals are. And so uh, she talked about how a lot of times people feel like if you're in a room and uh, the client is on one side of the room, the therapist is on the other. And matter of fact, I think she did this experiential exercise where there were a whole bunch of desks in the way or you know, between the two or that sort of thing. And the, a lot of people like to feel like um, therapy, and, and here's where I'm headed with this, is, um, you know, sympathy uh, is, uh, and, and maybe not quite empathy, is then seeing that person on the other side of the room and the person saying they need to get over to you and, you, and, and the sympathetic part of that is saying, you know, hey, yeah, I'm sorry, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the way, but here's what you need to do. You just need to go there, move left, go around that corner, you know, jump over that desk, that sort of thing not having any idea what that person's experience is like and coming up to those obstacles. And even if you have these stories of, look, I know exactly what you're going through. You know, I've been on that side of the room before as well. I've seen those desks in front of me too. And here's what I did. You know, it's not really taking into account what that person's experience is like. Empathy, and, uh, and, and in this concept, she was talking about being a good therapist, is, is walking over to them, standing beside them, and just saying, all right, here, let's go, let's do this. You know, let's get to the other side of that room. And as soon as we get run into an obstacle, then it's, uh, hey, what are you seeing? You know, tell me what this is like. What's your experience here? Have you ever, have you ever been in something like this before? If, if so, tell me about it. Tell me what you're afraid of. Uh, tell me, you know, tell me your success stories and getting around desks like this or over them. Or tell me times that you, you it's been difficult or you've maybe not been successful. And uh, let's work with that because I'm here for you. I can listen. I can, you know. But, uh, but I feel like that's a lot of times what our goal needs to be in uh, trying to develop empathy, whether it's uh, with our partners or our kids or our employees or just the neighbors, anybody around us, is uh, move from the other side of that room. Stand over there right beside them and say, all right, tell me what we're looking at here. Tell me what that's like for you. So, uh, again, thank you for spending time today learning more about empathy. I would highly encourage you to go back and I think it's uh, episode 67, Rules of Constructive Communication, where there's a little bit of talk about empathy there. And then something in the 90s, um, there's a two-part episode on how to teach your kids empathy. But kids, schmids, I don't know if that's a word, um, but uh, it's, it, I think it's a good thing to, to just to refresh your course on how to, how to nurture empathy in all of us. All right, so until next time, I'll see you again on the virtual couch. Okay, there you have it. I'm recording a closer now because I'm continuing to enjoy this, uh, this Oxbus all-encompassing platform recording system. If you haven't heard more about Oxbus, go visit oxbus.com. That's A-U-X-B-U-S.com. And uh, also go find the interview I did a little while ago with uh, Dan Radin. That's the CEO of Oxbus. Um, if you're even interested in podcasts or the behind the scenes or where the, the market's going, just a lot of fun there. But that, that's the, beside the point. This was supposed to be the closer, the what did we learn today? Hopefully you learned a few takeaways of uh, empathetic statements. 
and uh, and also maybe that difference between empathy and sympathy. And if you if you receive this episode, if somebody sent it to you and said, hey, I think you might benefit from this, please don't take offense to that because we could all do a lot better uh, at, at empathizing and learning really what empathy is because even those of us who mean well, and I'm guilty of this all the time, can fall into that, hey, I totally get where you're coming from. Let me tell you a whole bunch of stories. So if anything, I hope you've uh, learned a little more about uh, seeking first to understand and what some of those good empathetic phrases are sounding like. So until uh, next time, we'll see you again on the virtual couch. Hey, this is fun. Uh, this is the outro now. I just did the closer. Now we got the outro. I'm just I'm enjoying every moment of this Ox- Oxbus uh, experience. Um, apparently, episode music is playing quietly under the outro recording. So maybe here's where I just tell you thanks again for joining. If you don't mind uh, joining me on today's episode, if you don't mind, send this to somebody you think it might benefit. And uh, again, if you can rate or review or subscribe, leave a nice uh, comment. That would uh, just mean the world to me. And if you have any feedback, comments yourself, um, shoot them over to contact at tonyoverbay.com or contact at pathbackrecovery.com. Have a great week and, uh, and we'll see you again next time on the virtual couch. Oxbus.